Okay, I'm going to start. I know there are a few people making a run and they'll be in in a moment or two, but I just want to start by setting the stage, okay? Uh, I meet with each group, so I'll meet with you a second time, I meet each group twice. What, I'm do what I've decided to do, uh, I had to sort of do this on the fly because of, of time constraints. I'm going to talk about cell respiration today, and unfortunately, uh, although I try to make it as interactive as possible, and I do have tried to also apply it as much as possible, it does have the flavor of a more traditional lecture. So I sort of apologize for that, but uh, it's the nature of the material. Uh, it, you know, I, I sort of got, said, I got told, why don't you do cell respiration? Okay, because nobody else wanted to. Um, and uh, so that's, that's how, it, how it happened. Um, uh, then the second time we meet, I have a series of three case studies that I want to use, which will be built upon this, one which looks at a diet medicine, medication, uh, which is really interesting. It's, as I've been telling people, it's one that absolutely works, a diet pill that guaranteed to work. I, I, I know that that's the case. You can buy it on Amazon. YouTube. The only problem is, is the, the therapeutic dose is almost identical to the LD50 dose, which means that although it'll work, about 50% of you will die. Uh, and, but, but the sad part about it is it's still for sale. Uh, you know, that's what, what I find remarkable. The, the ad that I clipped is from Amazon by just doing a search on Amazon for it. And we'll do that next time. And then something, a uh, forensic case study that I have, which I think is it will demonstrate some good principles about cell, cell uh, uh, respiration. And the third one is just a sort of uh, overall case study with regard to cell respiration. So, so that will be the second time. Today, it's as I said, I want to sort of make sure that everyone is up to speed on this. And you, I mean, this is a high school group, so you probably are. And, and so I'm going to try not to go too quickly, but, but uh, because I want to get to the things at the end which deal with applications. Uh, so I'll try not to, not to go too quickly, so slow me down if I go too fast. Uh, I'll try to gauge by the number of people using their iPads as how, how fast I should go, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, I know, that's true, okay. <laughs> this, is, this is true. Okay, uh, where, I, where I start is, of course, saying that if we ask what is respiration, the first thing you're going to get students to answer is that it's breathing or inhalation, and that's fine, uh, particularly here uh, at Immaculata if I ask that, because everyone's going to be a doctor, so everyone's thinking medicine, so of course they think respiration, and that works because the nurse checks your respiration rate and writes down respiration rate, and that's fine, but of course that's not what we're going to be talking about because, like I said, I am specifically want to address cellular respiration, so that's this harvest of food to energy uh, that we're going to do. Before I go to that, there's just a few pet peeves I want to get uh, settled here. Um, as shown in this diagram and in many textbooks, you'll see photosynthesis and respiration always sort of connected. In fact, in some textbooks, you see them with, with arrows going in both directions, like there's some kind of uh, equilibrium equation. Don't do that, OK? I, I really object to that a lot because they are not reverse uh, reactions of one another. They are very different reactions. You cannot take a mitochondria and shine a light on it and get it to photosynthesize, nor can you put a chloroplast in the dark and get it to respire. It won't work, okay? So don't do that. Now, there are some relationships that are in fact true. That is, the oxygen that's produced in photosynthesis is used in respiration in, uh, in cellular respiration, or is used in cellular respiration, and the sugars produced are are used uh, by heterotrophs in respiration, so I don't have a problem with that. And, I, and the carbon dioxide produced by respiration is used in photosynthesis. That's fine. I, that's great, and that's that's probably there are probably good relationships to, to to show. But that idea that there's some kind of equivalency to them is just plain wrong. Okay, so the connection when it comes to photosynthesis and cell respiration is at the level of the global carbon uh, 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 cycling, global climate, uh, I want to keep saying climate because it is related to climate, but global carbon cycling. That is, the CO2 that is produced by animals is carbon that is released into the atmosphere. That CO2 in the atmosphere, which is carbon, is absorbed by plant tissue 
which is carbon, converted to carbohydrate, which is carbon, which is transferred back to animals. So that transfer, that is, that's the real connection, the important connection, is the global carbon cycle and uh, the oxygen as well. I mean, I, I don't mean to diminish that, but we'll just keep that. So that's just a pet peeve of mine, but I wanted to set that straight. When we talk about respiration, again, we're usually talking animals, but remember plants will respire. Uh, that is, you turn the lights out on a plant or allow it to get slightly dehydrated, that is a little bit of drought stress, and those plants will respire. I don't have the instruments uh, to measure it, but I bet if we went out and checked these trees right here in the parking lot, if not now, but in another hour or so, they would not be photosynthesizing anymore. Um, they're, they're under drought stress, I know, because I have a student working on them this summer, and he's doing measurements on actually the trees over by the uh, tennis court, not these right here, but the ones in the island, we're looking at comparing them to the ones that are over here by the greenhouse, and we've got eight weeks of data, and it's really pretty dramatic, but my point is, as soon as a tree, or any plant, but a tree in particular, gets a little bit drought stressed, that is, it gets hot in the late afternoon, it starts to, to run into problems with water, it's going to shut those stomates, shut down photosynthesis, and start to respire. It's just going to happen. There's, there's no doubt about it. So, yep, we mainly think about respiration in animals, but it certainly does occur in plants. The, what we're thinking, uh, talking about here is the concept of food uh, with oxygen uh, being placed into our bodies, uh, producing some water, some carbon dioxide as, an, uh, as a gas that we expel, and harvesting a great deal of energy. <clears throat> this is all set up based on glucose. Probably, well, there's a couple reasons for that. One reason that glucose is used as the, as the sort of starting uh, point for cell respiration is that you've got to pick a sort of universal starting point, uh, and that's a good one to start with, so, so do it. It's not very satisfying, but that's probably why. Another reason is, is that it, uh, glucose is the preferred fuel of most cells. That is, if you give a cell a, ch uh, a choice, <laughs> You give a cell a choice, uh, you, you'll find that they will, will use glucose uh, preferentially, at least most human cells will, muscle cells, uh, uh, skin cells, and certainly nerve cells. It's really the only fuel they can, they can effectively use. I, I mentioned that as well. That is, you know, when she was alive, my mom used to always tell me, well, when I was a kid, she probably still did even in later years, eat fish, it's, it's, it's brain food, she would always say. That's not true. The candy bar is the brain food, but that would have been a hard sell to her. Okay, but the point is, is that's the glucose. That really is what energizes the, 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 the cells, and, and when it comes to nerve cells, brain cells, uh, it's really the only fuel they can effectively use. Now, uh, asterisks, I, obviously you need other nutrients, but I'm not talking nutrients, I'm talking energy source here. Okay. The whole concept here, is the ATP cycle, the whole concept here when it comes to cell respiration is that, okay, you're going to, you're going to use glucose. You can use some other substrates too, amino acids and so forth, but you're use, we're, we're talking glucose here. You're using glucose, but at, in the form of glucose, there's a lot of energy. We know that because we know that sugar has a lot of calories, and we know that calories uh, is a measure of, of heat or energy, and so we know that sugar has a lot of energy in it. But in the form of glucose, it's really not useful to a cell. It's got to be converted, just like you would convert one currency into another. So that's where the term that ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the energy currency molecule of a, of a cell. You have to convert the energy uh, of the glucose, specifically the energy of the hydrogen atoms uh, of, the, of the glucose, into an effectively usable form, and that effectively usable form is adenosine triphosphate. The analogy I use is that adenosine diphosphate, which is down here, the 2-phosphate, the diphosphate group, is, is much like having a checking account. You can have a zero balance in your checking account and still have a checking account. To do something with that checking account, you have to add value. So, uh, cell respiration adds value by adding a third phosphate group. We'll talk about how that happens, but a third phosphate, phosphate group, just like you would add money uh, to, uh, to a checking account, so that's uh, adding value. At that point, you can do whatever you want with that check 
checking account within within some some boundaries at least you could send a nerve impulse you could send uh, you could reconstruct uh, a cell you could cause cell division you could transport materials across the membrane you could cause muscle contraction so once you make the ATP once you fill that account uh, you can spend that any way you want and that's what the cell does the other thing that I like about that analogy is that I thought of it, but the, 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 reason, uh, the other reason I like that analogy is that, that um, ATP is not, ATP is ephemeral, that is, it's short-lived. Cells cannot accumulate large amounts of ATP in their, in, in, inside them. Okay, they just cannot keep it. Uh, it's as if it spoils. It doesn't spoil. It just dissipates quickly, uh, just like the money in my checking account. Direct deposited today, gone tomorrow. Okay, and that's that's why I like that analogy. It's it's you have to you have to keep filling it. It's real time. So cells make ATP real time. That is, they make it as they need it. To the large part, there'll be a small residue of ATP around in the cell, but for the most part can't store it, got to, got to make it as you use it. So that's basically all I want from that ATP cycle. We also know that respiration occurs in two forms, aerobic, oops, yeah, aerobic with oxygen and anaerobic without. This group, I don't think I need to say anything more about that. Just to demonstrate a little bit about that and how that impacts our performance, these two graphs are, are sort of uh, conglomerations of of good athletes and the performance of, well, really of one uh, sort of put together into one typical uh, good athlete. Uh, I say a good athlete because you see on this axis it's time in hours and that person's exercising for four hours. So that ain't me. Okay, so, so the idea is, is that we're, we're looking at this. Now down here, this is in minutes. Uh, that's okay. And this is the same individual. And what I want to draw your attention to is the y-axis basically is simply the, um, <clears throat> the amount of activity. And uh, so we have the time or duration of the exercise, the, the amount of activity, the strenuousness, uh, the, the, the effort placed into it. And the third thing I want to show, uh, want you to see on both of these graphs is the dotted horizontal line that's the anaerobic threshold. What I, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Somebody will probably have to remind me, but yes, it will be there. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, there's this anaerobic threshold. What, what I want you to gather from this is that if the uh, degree of, 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 of um, uh, what do I want to say, of, of activity, the degree of activity is below that anaerobic threshold, you see that uh, the activity can go on for a very long period of time for what would be ma measured in minutes and minutes, maybe even hours. Okay, so it's a long period of time. That, if we're below the anaerobic threshold, we would in fact be aerobic and using aerobic cellular respiration. And so we see that aerobic cellular respiration is for the long term, for the long haul. Down here, we took those same athletes, um, okay, since this is based on an average, and forced them to work even harder. Okay? What we see happened is that their endurance uh, time, that is the time that they can, can perform, is greatly uh, constricted. It goes from four hours. Now, yeah, over here he's getting tired and it starts to drop down. We, we know that's going to happen. No one can go on forever. Um, uh, but down here, you see this is in minutes. We go from several hours to about two minutes. He's exceeded the anaerobic threshold. He's switched, he or she, has switched to anaerobic respiration. And the, the take home here is, is now you're, on, you, you're still performing. You're performing at a very high rate, 100% of his peak, but uh, at a high rate. But you're on borrowed time, OK? Because this is a much shorter period of time. So the idea that we see from this well, actually, let's use that and the next ones uh, are that, that generally the idea is, is that aerobic is used for the long haul, anaerobic is used for those peak uh, periods, those, those uh, uh, bursts of activity. Okay? This is not my data, 
uh, or even from any of my textbooks. This is from Boseman Biology. You know Boseman? I don't know Mr. Anderson. Uh, okay. Uh, if you don't, Google Boseman as in Boseman, Montana, because he's in Boseman, Montana. Puts together some really nice videos. So I stole this from one of his videos. This is just cut and pasted from his video. Um, so I gave him credit. It's in real tiny letters down here. Uh, okay, but I, I just thought this was a clever idea that he used to sort of demonstrate really the previous slide in a different way. What he did was go to the track and field events and he got all the events from 100 meters to 10,000 meters. So the length increases of the event along here. And he calculated the pace, that is meters per second, along the y-axis. And I added the lines here, but this line shows that as the endurance, the length of the endurance uh, event, let me rephrase that, the length of the event, the length, the, as the length of the event increases, you see that the pace drops off. That is, for someone to complete a 10,000 meter race, they have a slower pace than someone who's running the 100 meter, I don't know if that's a dash. It wouldn't be a dash if I was doing it, but uh, uh, the one 100 meter sprint. Uh, okay, we'll call it. What you, so you see that. Let's also look at the idea that we have this sort of area down here, this baseline uh, that you would that all of these runners would be able to maintain for for fairly long periods of time. That is this level of uh, of somewhere just above six uh, six point two or so uh, meters per second is sort of the baseline. What we're actually looking at here is the aerobic for the long haul. The aerobic. Uh, portion of respiration for these athletes versus the anaerobic, which is this sort of, like I said, the spurt, the sprint, the, 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 uh, the short burst of energy. So it's just another way of looking at this, but I kind of like that. I thought that was kind of clever because we can see that that's exactly the kind of performance uh, profile that we see in athletes uh, based upon uh, aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Okay, so. Aerobic with oxygen, that, I don't know why that says energy, it should say anaerobic without oxygen. Uh, the only other thing that I want you to see on this diagram is that there's a lot of ATP produced aerobically, whoops, and less uh, produced anaerobically. Namely, there are two ATP per glucose, since we're scaling this to glucose, two ATP per glucose in, uh, in anaerobic respiration and about 38. It depends on what textbook you use. 34, 36, 38 ATP. That's because it depends on the cell, depends on the experimental conditions under which you measure it, and it also depends on the substrates, uh, the, the additional substrates that might interfere. But in any event, it's somewhere around. The key is that it's almost 19 times more energy uh, per harvested by aerobic rather than anaerobic respiration. No wonder your body wants to stay aerobic. Okay, wants to maintain aerobic conditions. Um, say what? It said requires energy, it does not require energy. That's what I said, that's a misprint. I, this, yeah. this should say, this says required oxygen, that should say does not require oxygen. I don't know, I didn't even notice that, that actually, I didn't notice that till the very, the session right before lunch, somebody came up. So I used it all week and never noticed it. I was always saying oxygen and I saw oxygen because that's what I was saying and somebody said, you know, that slide's wrong. And I looked and they're right. I, uh, so I, I apologize, but it was too late to change it. Uh, so it should say without oxygen, does not require oxygen. Um, the only thing, <coughs> a couple, well, just a couple short things from this which are obvious, that is the sugar. The sugar is the source of the carbon dioxide. That is what cellular respiration does is systematically chop the glucose molecule into small pieces. Those small pieces are carbon dioxide that is exhaled. As I say, if we could, we can't, but if we could take uh, sugar and color it blue and ingest it, we would exhale blue carbon dioxide. That's where the carbon dioxide comes from. It's from the skeletal backbone of the glucose. Water picks up protons and, be, uh, excuse me, I said that wrong. Oxygen picks up protons and becomes water. 
And so that's where the, where the water comes from, that is oxygen plus two protons and some electrons at the end of the electron transport system uh, becomes water. That's, and there's, of course, lots of ATP. Like I said, this is glucose. The energy source are really these hydrogen ions. Um, what the, what's going to happen are a couple of events here. We're going to break apart that carbon skeleton, as I said, and dispose of it. When we do that, we're going to have electrons come off of that, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The other thing that we're going to do is harvest protons off of this, which will also be useful for the cell. So, so it's like we'll break this glucose molecule apart, and that's really great, but we do it in a way that we can use all the parts in an appropriate fashion to generate 38 ATP, which is a, which is a pant load of ATP. Okay, my first, uh, the, like I said, first, uh, uh, question here is, what's the fate of oxygen consumed in cellular respiration? Does it combine with carbon dioxide to form, or excuse me, does it combine with carbon to form carbon dioxide? Does it combine with hydrogen to form water? Does it combine with water to release CO2? Does it uh, combine with glucose to form lactic acid? These are anonymous, so if you would just pick them up and click them, uh, they'll flash at you. Um, uh, and the number response will increase up there. And when I get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 17 or so, I'll, I'll quit. 16 or 17. What happens when they say an athlete hits the wall? Are they anaerobic? Yep. They're anaerobic. I'm going to talk about that later. But, but keep me, make sure I do. Yep. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I am going to talk about that, but don't let me, don't let me get away with, with not answering, but I, I will. Yeah, I'd rather wait till then. Okay. Do I have enough of a response? It doesn't click at you or anything. It, 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 maybe the batteries are dying. They were working from the back of the room. Yeah, they were still working. Okay. It only allows you to click once, so you can keep clicking, but it won't do anything. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna just take it from you there. Okay, oh, we got a split here. Combines with carbon atoms to form CO2, combines with hydrogen ions to form water. Okay. You're just fooling with me, right? Okay, um, the answer is B, okay? Uh, it's the oxygen is the final acceptor of the electrons, so the electrons go on to the oxygen, and then two protons are added to balance everything, make it nice, and ship it out as water. Okay, so that's the answer. Um, like I said, CO2, CO2 comes from the carbon chain, well, carbon chain, carbon skeleton of the glucose molecule when it's cleaved uh, in various stages throughout the process. Okay, so, so the key there is, is that that oxygen uh, is used as a final acceptor, and then you add protons. Oxidation is what's happening in this process of cellular respiration. Oxidation is the loss of electrons. We see oxidation occur very quickly in a fire. Uh, you could burn the glucose, you'd get fire, or you'd get light, you'd get heat, but then you wouldn't have anything after a few seconds. Uh, respiration can take long periods of time, weeks, months, years, and rust on a chain. Uh, it can take a few minutes as it takes place in an apple when you cut it. The browning is oxidation that takes place uh, uh, because of exposure to the oxygen in the air. Uh, but what we're talking about is the respiration that takes place here here in the mitochondria. I don't really have to go through too much with the mitochondria with you guys. Uh, the, key, the key items about this particular cell organelle, they're much smaller than chloroplasts, so you're really not, it's really hard to, to, to visualize these in a normal laboratory. Um, chloroplasts, no, you can get those pretty easy, but it's really hard to visualize these. You can, but you've got to have pretty good optics on your scopes and a lot of patience and the right, right preps. But uh, it's probably not worth it. Um, the, so they're small. But the key here is, is that there's a double membrane, this, in, this convoluted inner membrane and an outer membrane, giving us an intermembrane space, which will be pivotal in this process. Um, an inner matrix, which uh, will also be important because it's where Krebs cycle occurs. Uh, yeah, there's some other things in here like ribosomes and DNA, because these things uh, have their own genome, uh, as do chloroplasts. 
Um, I'm always sticking up for chloroplasts. But they, they, they both have their own genome. They, they repli they're self-replicating. Um, they, you know, so the, the theory is, is, of course, that they were independent organisms that took up residence in eukary and, and created eukaryotic cells. I don't know if that's true, but that's, that's the theory. So we're talking about oxidation taking place. Um, we're also going to be producing ATP. Now, the electrons come from the, the, the uh, glucose molecule, and they are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are harvested from the glucose molecule when the glucose is broken apart, when it's catalyzed and broken apart into say, fragments of, of carbon dioxide and protons are coming off, the hydrogen ions are coming off. There's, a, there's an issue there. That is, the cell simply can't allow and will not allow the electrons to just scatter out into the cytoplasm or into the, uh, into the matrix of the, uh, uh, of the uh, mitochondria uh, for, for lots of reasons, if you think about it. One is, is that if those electrons were allowed to escape into the cytoplasm, they could bombard other, other entities within the uh, cell. Uh, Ionize them, cause the formation of free radicals, which can cause cancer and cause uh, aging and cause uh, degradation of the telomeres of the chromosomes and all kinds of things. That's why you take uh, antioxidants to prevent that from happening, but uh, you know because it can happen in other reactions. So the cell's not going to let that happen. Uh, so we don't do that. We don't allow electrons to, to just go out into the cytoplasm because a flow of electrons is electricity, and so you wouldn't want electrical currents just sort of scattering around in the cytoplasm. That would be kind of counterproductive. And the other reason is because is these electrons are energy. And you're not going to just let that energy go dissipating out into the cytoplasm without harvesting it. So, in order to prevent all those things from happening, the cell has electron acceptors or electron shuttles. Uh, those are, are going to be carriers that take the electrons from uh, a source, from a particular substrate in a particular reaction of cell respiration, and move those to the electron transport chain. Um, Ooh, where, okay, I guess I'll get to that. One of them is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. The other is flavin adenine dinucleotide. Uh, I have a slide on those, but I guess it's after this one. Uh, so I'll come back to that in a second. Um, the other thing that's going to be happening is we are making ATP. We make it two ways here, and uh, just because this is verbiage that I think folks should know. Substrate phosphorylation is what I call phosphorylation that occurs along the main stream of the process. It's where some of the, rea some of the substrates that are actually involved in the cellular respiration pathway transfer phosphates to ATP or excuse me, to ADP to form ATP. That's called substrate level. And oxidative phosphorylation is the stuff that occurs in the mitochondria with oxygen and the use of the electron transport chain. Um, where are those? I don't know. They'll show up. My, my nicotinamide molecule will show up here somewhere for some reason. You'd think after all this. Um, cell respiration has, I divide into three parts. Most, most uh, textbooks do. Uh, glycolysis, transition reaction, and then the Krebs cycle and ETS or ETC, whichever you want to call it. Those three processes. These two are con connected so much and so integrated, one can't work without the other. So, so they're, in fact, called coupled. And so they are considered as one. Glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm. The transition reaction is, is actually a movement from the cytoplasm into the matrix of the chloroplast. The Krebs cycle occurs in the matrix of the chloroplast. And the electron transport system is embedded in the uh, intermembrane, inner membrane of the uh, mitochondria. The first step. Oh, I know why. Okay, the first step is called first set of steps is called glycolysis. That's uh, and again we could go through all kinds, but as you can see, I just kept them as intermediates. I didn't even give them names. Uh, you may even know the names. That's cool. I just don't need that right now. Um, but we're going to go from glucose to pyruvate. That's 
what I'm calling glycolysis. We're going to go from a six carbon molecule to two three carbon molecules. That's essential because everything below this then runs twice, is doubled. And that's critical in the concept that we're going to harvest a great deal of ATP. So from six to three carbons, um, these, these molecules of pyruvate sort of, uh, you could think of them as the right and left sides of glucose. So one molecule is the left side, one molecule is the right side, however you'd like to think of that. So that's the sort of overall scheme. We are going to produce ATP, it's substrate phosphorylation that occurs in this process. Uh, yes, it does occur down here somewhere, but again, I'm not worried about the step. It's substrate phosphorylation it occurs for, you get a net of two ATP per glucose. The other thing is, as it's not shown on here, is we are going to harvest electrons off of this, so there will be some NADH uh, formed, that is, uh, some of the nicotinamide will be reduced. Uh, the only other thing that I want to mention for you guys is this step here. I won't, again, get into uh, what that step is, but phosphofructokinase, PFK, is the rate-limiting step of cellular respiration. That's what controls, that'll control the rate of the whole process, um, and so uh, it's probably an enzyme of note. To some, uh, to some people because it does help determine whether or not this process is going to work and it is inhibited by ATP, so high levels of ATP will shut it down because you don't need ATP if there's some around and if there's none around then it's uninhibited, changes conformation, becomes active and the process begins again. So gly that's glycolysis, I don't need those steps. Here's my nicotinamide molecule, I knew it was here. Um, it's nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. I point out nicotinamide, nicotine, yeah, it's related to that. Adenine dinucleotide, hmm, sounds like uh, adenine, thiamine, cytosine, guanine, yeah, it's a nucleotide there. I only point that out because living systems do that. They create apps, that is, they create, in this case, uh, molecules that can can be plugged into a variety of different processes, uh, um, into the genome, into messenger RNA, into uh, energy processes, et cetera. Even the ATP molecule has a, a derivative of this. So my, uh, I just point that out, that, that that happens a lot in living things. That is where something is found that can be used, and so it evolves and is used. The, it, it's adapted to a variety of different things. The, the key here in, whoops, the key to, okay, the key to this is to stop whatever you're doing here. That's what I wanted. Um, the, uh, the nicotinamide molecule, the, adne, the, the NAD molecule, as you see, for the most part, this is static. It's only this ring structure which, which is readily reduced or oxidized. So that's all the importance of this is, that it can readily accept electrons and readily give up those electrons uh, as, it, as it moves from one part of the cell to the other, which is why it's called an electron shuttle. Okay, that's all I want that. I want to just look at the oxygen present uh, process right now. I'll get to uh, uh, anaerobic in a moment. Uh, we've, we've run, the, the cell has already performed glycolysis, so we've got pyruvate. Now we have to move that pyruvate into the mitochondria. That's done through the, what's called the transition reaction. Uh, the transaction, transition reaction has a couple of things of note. One is that it peels off a carbon. Now there goes one of the carbon dioxides that we exhale. So we go from a three carbon to a two carbon molecule. So we've gone from a six to two three carbons. Now we've broken those further down into two carbon molecules called acetyl-CoA, coenzyme A, derivative of vitamin A. It's what you need it for in your, in, in your diet. Uh, you've also heard of CoQ10. Co that's, that's this enzyme, um, again, uh, I don't know if taking those supplements are good or not, as, as I've been told by a nutritionist. If you can afford to take vitamins, you probably don't need them, because you probably eat well enough anyway. If you can't afford vitamins, you probably need them, because you're probably not eating well. Uh, so, you know, that's usually a, a good rule of thumb, but it doesn't hurt. Uh, so CoQ10 uh, you can buy and take. Uh, to help cell respiration. It boosts metabolism, if you read the label. That's what they say. It seems like it might work. I don't know. 
So this is in transitioning from the cytoplasm to inside the, uh, the mitochondria. Um, it's sometimes also called pyruvate, pyruvate oxidation. Uh, again, that depends on who's writing the book, but uh, I've always known it as the transition reaction. The Krebs cycle is the next step. I'm not going through all these steps. I just want to point out some, I think it's like four highlights that I have. First of all, it is a cycle. Uh, it's, it, it's, it, it is a cycle, so you start with something, go through a series of steps and come back. I think that's worth note. Uh, Acetyl-CoA co combines with, uh, with a constitutive element, uh, OAA, oxalo, uh, oxaloacetate, or oxaloacetic acid uh, back in the old days, but uh, oxaloacetate. So we take this two carbon plus this one, two, three, four carbon, and we get a six carbon up here and then we're going to end up breaking that apart, as we'll see. Um, that's why I mention that only because the first identifiable product in the process is called citrate or citric acid, so this is sometimes called the citric acid cycle, too. Basically, the difference is that if your chemist teaches you this, he's going to call it a citric acid cycle. If a biologist teaches you this, she's going to call it a Krebs cycle, named in honor of George Krebs, uh, who elucidated most of the steps. Okay, so uh, uh, that's the, the only, uh, only difference, otherwise they're the same. So I call it the Krebs cycle, okay? Um, so that's the idea of the cycle. The, the other thing is that there is some substrate phosphorylation that takes place. That is one place, but it happens twice because this thing goes around twice for every glucose. So there's two substrate phosphorylations that take place. Uh, there's um, carbon dioxide comes off there. Carbon dioxide comes off there. Remember, one came off up here when this went from uh, pyruvate to acetyl CoA, so that's one. A second one comes off here, that's two. Another one here, three. I'm not worried about where they are because this isn't a biochem class, so we won't learn the intermediate steps. That's the three carbons. We've now destroyed the, the glucose molecule entirely, it's been completely dismantled. Okay? And so we've gotten rid of the glucose mo molecule. All of this would be. This, this, and the one that was over here would have been exhaled. It's gone. Okay, it would try to diffuse into the bloodstream, to the lungs, and out. Okay. The other thing is, is that because we're rearranging these molecules, and in some cases pulling out carbon dioxide from it, that is disrupting the molecular structure, we often end up with electrons escaping. And so you can see here that there are electron acceptors grabbing those electrons because they're energy sources that we want. There are two, uh, nicotinamide and flavoprotein. Um, they just sort of, they're obviously shaped a little differently as far as their molecular structure, and they pick up electrons that are a little different in energy potential, but otherwise they're basically the same. That's all I need from that. So we've gone through glycolysis, the transition reaction, and the Krebs cycle. Now, at the end of the Krebs cycle, we have a whole bunch of uh, reduced NAD and FA NADH, uh, in a, that's the reduced form, and FADH2, the reduced form of the flavor protein. We have a whole bunch of those uh, accumulated. We have to cash those in. Uh, just like you would do after you leave the, uh, the roulette table with all your chips, you have to go to the window and cash them in. Although I guess now you don't, it's all on the card. Uh, but in any event, the idea is that you have to cash it in. That cashing in occurs at the electron transport system or ele electron transport chain, or sometimes it's called the cytochrome chain. It does contain a series of cytochromes, so that's not a bad name, but uh, most call it the electron transport system what it is is a set of, of well, proteins, lipoproteins, and, uh, and carbo, uh, carboaminos uh, proteins, that some of which, as you can see, are transmembrane, some of which are embedded in the membrane, some of which partially protrude through the membrane. The whole purpose here is, is to pass electrons in an orderly fashion from one cytochrome to the next, Ultimately, they'll end up in water, but are attached to oxygen to form water. As these 
electrons are passed <laughs> along, energy is extracted from them, they are literally moved from one energy level to another, and when that happens, that energy is used, and God knows, I'm allowed to say that because we're at Immaculata, God knows how, that, uh, how it happens, but those hydrogen uh, protons are pumped across this membrane from the matrix, or excuse me, from the from, from, yeah, from the matrix area of the, of the, the um, mitochondria to the intermembrane uh, space of the mitochondria. So as the electrons move through this chain, pro proton pumps are activated to cause the accumulation of protons in this space between the membranes, so much so that it actually becomes acidic. Well, um, let's, let me finish this. Um, the, as, because we're extracting energy in each of these steps, eventually these electrons are low energy electrons. The cell need, no longer can extract, uh, efficiently extract energy from them, so they, and they still have to be dealt with. So they are simply in this last place using cytochrome oxidase, which will be uh, which is a fairly important enzyme. But the cytochrome oxidase simply catalyzes the addition of the electrons and protons to oxygen to form water. So we say oxygen is the final acceptor of electrons in, cellular, in, uh, in, uh, in aerobic cellular respiration. Now, we've got this buildup of protons, we're all but done with this, uh, buildup of protons here, and then we have this really nice de device over here called an ATP synthase. The ATP synthase is a motor that's embedded within the uh, mitochondrial membrane, and clearly only God knows how this works, but as protons, which are built up in a high concentration because of the, uh, the pumping that's done by the uh, electron transport system, uh, protons are allowed to pass through this rotor mechanism of the synthase. It literally spins, we know that for a fact, and somehow an interaction of this catalytic head with this sort of armature of, of protein causes the addition of phosphates to ADP to form ATP. And again, there you go. You could win a Nobel Prize. But you know, as, as I say, you don't really want the Nobel Prize. I mean, that's got a lot of prestige, but if you want the real money, you want the MacArthur Award in science. It's about three times the award amount of the Nobel Prize. Not as many people will know about it, but you can laugh to the bank on that. So. Shoot for the MacArthur Award, not, not the Nobel Prize. Um, anyway, the, so we don't have any idea how this works. We just know it's there and we know it works. It's, it's located adjacent to the, the cytochrome chains, or that is uh, the, uh, the cytochrome chains of the electron transport system, and it allows those hydrogen ions back. So there's a circulation of hydrogen ions in this process, and these are coupled together. This can only operate if we have this accumulation of hydrogen ions. This can only operate if hydrogen ions are placed back here. If they are all moved up here, the process can't work. All of it is pivotal upon having oxygen to dump those electrons in. Anything that interferes with that oxygen concentration will shut this down, will shut that down, and we'll be back to glycolysis as the only viable pathway. Okay. Okay. Uh, so in summary, glucose goes to pyruvate. Pyruvate is then converted to acetyl-CoA and enters the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle tears that molecule apart and harvests electrons. Those electron shuttles go to the electron transport system, activate pu proton pumps that, whoops, that establish that uh, concentration of hydrogen ions in the uh, intermembrane space, and the synthase, uh, of course there's more than one, but that synthase allows the protons back across and harvests ATP. How much ATP? About 38 ATP per glucose, which as I said, if you think of glycolysis as two, and this is 38, that's 19 times more. No wonder your cells prefer it. Who wouldn't want to get paid $19 per glucose rather than $2 per glucose? Okay, so it makes sense, okay? Don't need that for anything. Now I want to talk a little bit about anaerobic, and so I asked you the question. If anaerobic respiration were, excuse me, I didn't say that, read that correctly. If aerobic respiration were to be prevented in human muscle cells for about one or two minutes, what would be the result? The tissue would die, you'd have severe cramping and spasms, you'd switch to anaerobic respiration, or 
you just lose consciousness. What do you think? Okay, most of you put ABC, C is the correct answer, that is you switch to anaerobic, which sort of makes sense if, you, if you're not aerobic, you got to be anaerobic, that's the only one that mentions anaerobic, so that's sort of how I'd go, even if you didn't know anything about lactic acid formation. So yeah, that's correct. Uh, so good, you probably knew that before you stepped in the door. Okay? That brings me to the anaerobic problem, okay, as, as I put it. If oxygen is present, that is, if we're aerobic, then we don't have a problem. That is, glucose goes through glycolysis to pyruvate, to the transition reaction, to the Krebs cycle, blah, 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 blah. oxygen in the final acceptor, life is good. What we're doing is regenerating those electron shuttles, the NAD plus and the FAD, uh, regenerating them in their oxidized form because they are donating the electrons to the electron transport chain uh, so that they can cause chemoosmosis, etc., which I've said two or three times now. That's fine in aerobic. In anaerobic, you shut that system down. So there's no oxygen to accept the electrons, so the electron chain shuts, uh, uh, transport system shuts down. The synthetase shuts down, the transition reaction shuts down, and the only thing available to the cell is to go from glucose to pyruvate. Now, there's only a finite number of these NAD molecules in a cell. Let's say there are 100. I don't know how many there are. I don't know if anybody's ever counted. What that would mean is that this could happen 100 times, then you will have put electrons into all 100 of these molecules, and the cell would come to a dead stop. Not good. That's a problem. That's an anaerobic problem. So what do you do? Well, you need something that will regenerate the oxidized form of the electron carrier so that this process can continue so that you can keep making ATP. Well, muscle and liver cells have found a way to do that. Okay? The way they do it is they convert pyruvate to lactate. Now, that requires some molecular rearrangement, but the cool part about it is it requires a few electrons. So the pyruvate to lactate allows these electrons to be donated. The NAD is generated back in the oxidized form. It can go back up, allow more pyruvate to be made, dump its electrons in lactate, go up and make more pyruvate. You're, in the meantime, you're making lots of ATP, well, not lots, you're making two ATP for every cycle. Not not as good as 38, but it's a living. Okay? That works fine. Okay? If you're a bacteria cell or a yeast cell, well, you don't use lactate, but you go for ethyl alcohol. Same idea, you've got this pyruvate, you convert it to ethyl alcohol, you have some carbon dioxide comes off, you know that, and rising bread and so forth. I always thought that, I always wondered why bakers get up early in the morning, but now I know, because they're happy to do it, because they smell all that ethyl alcohol from the rising bread, so why not get up? It's a nice morning. Uh, the idea is that, again, it's regenerating the oxidized form. This can continue as a cycle. We can generate ATP. In fact, uh, depending on the species you pick, that is, if you pick the Sarcomedes, yes, you can get the alcohol, the ethyl alcohol and produce uh, uh, wine or beer or ethyl alcohol to put in our cars, but don't get me started on that. I don't understand why we use food in our cars, but that's a whole different matter. But well, I do know, you know, uh, I got to say that. We don't do that, you know, we don't add ethanol to our gasoline to, to make us energy independent. You know that. We do it to support the Nebraska farmers and the corn farmers. They're a strong, strong lobby, and we will always put ethanol, as long as there's a Nebraska farmer, we will always put ethanol in our gas. It doesn't matter. It doesn't do anything. It's not, it's not energy efficient. It's actually a net energy loss if you do the, the life cycle analysis. It's, you know, it's, it's less efficient. You have to burn more of that gas in order to go because there's not as much calories in it as in gasoline. So you actually burn more of it and produce more CO2. 
but it does keep corn farmers uh, happy. So that's really why we do it. Okay. Uh, now, uh, enough of that. That was uh, uh, brought to you. That that's a public opinion. Yeah, by me. I'm sorry, but it's true. Okay. So we could use that, or you could switch to certain bacteria and produce propionic acid, like you would use in Swiss cheese and. Uh, and uh, some of the blue cheeses and so forth. Or you could switch to bacillus and get lactic acid and produce cheeses and yogurts and so forth. Or clostridium like clostridium botulinum and so forth and produce acetone and isopropyl alcohol or, or t acetic acid. That is you could pick these organisms. What they all are doing is picking different products to dump those electrons in so that they can run glycolysis and remember, glycolysis does not involve oxygen, so they can run glycolysis and continue to produce ATP. Okay. Actually, we're going to get done early, so just stick with me, okay? But you'll have to be quiet, okay? Uh, but because I usually take a break, but when I looked at 2 o'clock and see where I am, I figure I'll just race for the end, and then you can, you can just have a break at the end rather than at the beginning, in the middle, okay? So just bear with me. What I, what I want to do with what we just talked about is look at muscle activity in a human under exercise conditions and how that relates. Okay? Uh, that, that won't take very long. Remember that muscles can operate in two... Of course, this is all being recorded, so I just blew it. But anyway, the whole, the whole thing here is, is that muscles can work aerobically or anaerobically. Okay? Uh, they prefer aerobic. Why? Because they get more energy. That is 38 ATP. They prefer aerobic because it's sustainable. It goes on for a long period of time. Uh, that's good enough reasons. Uh, anaerobic uh, is going to be for short term. But the advantage is if there's no oxygen or oxygen is low, it's an alternative. It's better than nothing. Two is better than zero. To sort of explain some of this, uh, or at least to get started, I want you to think of this timeline of this little guy starting at, a, at the starting block, and then he's racing and he's at the end of the race, okay? If you think of it in those terms, when you start out exercising, r running or whatever, there is some residual ATP in your cell. Well, I said that. It, there's not much because you can't keep it around, but there is. Turns out it's about three seconds worth. Okay? So the first three seconds you, that you start your activity, zip, you, you are using the ATP that's in the cell. Now there's a way to stretch that a little bit, and that's called creatine phosphate. And I want to mention this because you may have heard of this. That is, the cells have an, a, a sort of adjunct that they can do. That is, at rest, they will take ATP and they will take creatine, E-A-N, and they will convert that to creatine phosphate. That's at rest. Then, during activity, they will take that creatine phosphate, convert it back to creatine, and make ATP. It's a, sort of a way to hedge the bet. That's on this graph they are calling it the phosphagene system. I don't know why, but I prefer to think of it as creatine phosphate. And what it is is just a chemical that has evolved that is in the cells of muscle cell, or in muscle cells, which can accumulate in, in, in quantity during rest and will extend that period of which uh, of initial muscle contraction that can operate right away on call. Because remember, the idea here is we need, we need fast bursts at the beginning here because we're trying to get away from that saber-toothed tiger or something. Okay? So, so you, know, you have to really be able to put the pedal to the metal. This will work, okay? And this does it. This adds, oh, this really adds a lot, probably up to eight to 10 seconds. Uh, but that might be enough to get out of the way of the saber toothed tiger, whatever the case may be. But it adds about eight to 10 seconds. So, again, if you start from zero and you exercise the first three seconds, ATP are in the cell, the next seven seconds or eight seconds will be creatine phosphate. Now, have you ever heard of creatine phosphate uh, as, a, as a dietary supplement? You can go to the 
general nutrition store and they sell in huge bottles, you know. You got the money, they got the creatine phosphate. Um, in fact, there was uh, 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 someone from high school in an earlier session who said that the, that the tennis coach was encouraging uh, the students at, at her high school to take creatine phosphate. I would say any coach that would encourage any of that is, you know, in this day and age of liability, uh, I wouldn't go near it. Uh, but let's say some things about creatine phosphate. The theory would be that if you have this natural substance in your body, and it does extend that burst time that if you could add more to it, you could extend that burst time and improve performance. That's the, that's the idea. Does it work? Yeah, actually it does. It will increase, if you take creatine phosphate for about 8 to 12 weeks in that neighborhood, you will see a 1 to 3 percent increase in performance. A 1 to 3 percent. Now, is that enough for high school athletes? I doubt that it would matter for high school athletes. Now, would that be enough if you were an ultra athlete uh, in a highly competitive sport in your, you know, uh, say an NFL player or, or an NBA player? Yeah, it might, that, might, that boost of performance might be enough to make the difference between that $25 million contract and that $33 million contract. So if you check the locker rooms, they're all, almost all taking it, okay? Uh, um, I, tennis players, I, I don't get it because I think of tennis as you know, it's like pretty low key, but maybe it's not. Uh, maybe that's why I'm not on the tennis team. Uh, but, but, but in any event, no, I'm just joking. But, but uh, the point is, is that, that it does have some, uh, some validity to it. So I, I like to give credit where credit due. So when you see it. Now, uh, the ads that I've seen greatly overplay it. You know, they make it like you take this and not only will you bulk up and look great and have abs, which instantly appear in almost all those ads, but you'll, and you also have uh, a great performance. But it's a one to three percent. I mean, that's the that's the real data. Um, one thing I will guarantee, though, is you'll have a ten percent weight gain, okay? Uh, because it causes water retention, so you're going to suck up water and balloon up. Now, the only problem with that, or, you know, that can easily be solved if you are on a team with a team doctor and somebody to prescribe a diuretic, you know, and then you can pull it back down. But the problem is, is kids then decide, well, I can't get, uh, gain weight, so I'll pop, they'll find a way to get the diuretic, and they'll take it. And if the, that's not regulated, if they get dehydrated and they just have the slightest heart irregularity, boom, that'll show up and they'll be laying on the field. And, and so I think it's dangerous, but, but the, the creatine phosphate by itself, you know, it, I'm not a proponent of it, and I'm not saying, I'm not recommending it to anyone, but I'm just saying the data are there that it will give you a 1 to 3 percent uh, boost oh, if you take it. Of course, the day you stop it, about 24 hours later, it'll go away. Uh, so it's something that you take constantly. You don't, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get you there and then you stop. You have to continue to take it. But there doesn't seem to be a lot of adverse side effects of creatine phosphate as there is, for instance, for antibiotic steroids. Antibiotic steroids are just downright dangerous. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, creatine phosphate, not necessarily uh, uh, as, as harmful. Um, uh, well, as I just said, under those circumstances. Okay, so we have this guy. He's run for the first oh, minute or so. Uh, or, well, actually, not even that. The first 10 to 15 seconds of his race, he's spent all his ATP, all his creatine phosphate. He still has a fair amount of oxygen in the, in the bloodstream around him and uh, in the muscle itself. There will be a fair amount of myoglobin. Uh, what's myoglobin? Hmm? Sounds like hemoglobin, okay? It's, it's a pigment found in muscle that it works just like hemoglobin in the sense that it can rapidly uh, uh, pick up 
oxygen. So think of it sort of like an oxygen sponge. Uh, skeletal muscle will contain a fair amount, uh, particularly highly active skeletal muscle. So if you were able to look at a sprinter's legs, peel the skin back and look at the muscle, it'd be really dark uh, because there'd be lots of myoglobin. Think of your, think of your Thanksgiving turkey, okay? The drumstick, because uh, they can run on their legs and they're allowed to run on their legs. There's lots of dark meat, myoglobin. The, the breast meat of a turkey is white because there's no myoglobin in it because those turkeys aren't allowed to fly and that's the flight muscles and they're not allowed to fly. If you look at a duck where there's lots of flight, then there's all dark meat, right? Because there's lots of myoglobin. Myoglobin can donate oxygen. So what's that got to do with this? Well, okay, after we've used up the ATP, use the creatine phosphate, then there's still oxygen available to run cell respiration and there's that little bit of a lag time and cell respiration can kick in and there's lots of oxygen so you're going to stay aerobic everything's cool you're going to use the myoglobin how long does that last that lasts oh probably a good 60 to 90 seconds okay and so now you're at that point you have exhausted oxygen levels have stopped to, started to drop in the muscle cells you go anaerobic about at that about 60 second somewhere in that neighborhood. I have to say ranges because it would depend on how, how strenuously you're, at, you're, you're uh, exercising, what the activity is, and what your training status is, you know, how, how healthy you are. Uh, but somewhere in that neighborhood, you would switch to anaerobic. That is, it would go to the formation of lactic acid. Now the clock's ticking because we know that lactic acid buildup, uh, you know, you only have about two minutes or so of lactic acid buildup that you, or you'll start to see significant decline in muscle activity. That's fine though for a sprinter because we're talking three minutes. The race is over, okay? They, you know, boom. They're done and they're all running around, they're done, right? So, so for a sprinter, that's fine. For the long distance runner, what has to happen next is, in that time up to three minutes, the heart is ramping up, the, the lungs are ramping up. By that I mean the heart rate's going up, the output of the heart is going up, so we're getting more blood out, deeper and more, more numerous breaths, so we're getting oxygenated blood. So by about three minutes, we go back to being aerobic. So you go crea ATP, creatine phosphate, a little bit of aerobic, anaerobic, then back to aerobic for the rest of the race. Well, actually, this is 40 seconds, so it would be out out, out, out here, but in a, in, a, in a race such as that. So my, what I want you to understand from that is that when you exercise, you start out aerobic, go anaerobic, and then back to aerobic, because aerobic is for the long term. Uh, and so there's that switching that takes place there. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that cells, muscle cells, love to use glucose. So they, have the, they store glucose in the cell, but they can't store glucose. So they convert the glucose to the polysaccharide glycogen and store it in the muscle. And you can see it here, these dark granules. Um, the reason I mention that, oh, and then that can be readily converted back to glucose and used either anaerobic or aerobically. And I'll show you a graph that that can be used for quite some time, even during aerobic respiration. Um, but the idea is it's a glucose source. So your cells have, have found a way to maintain their favorite food, glucose, by, by, by storing it as glycogen. You've ever heard of carbohydrate loading? that uh, athletes do. That is, they eat a high carbohydrate, you know, spaghetti, whatever, high carbohydrate meal the evening before or the afternoon before the big race. What that's doing is that starch converted to glucose into the bloodstream, sent to the muscles, converted to glycogen, and now we've stored glycogen in the muscle as a ready source of energy for, for, uh, for that activity. The neat part about the human body is you can train it. So if those athletes will carbohydrate load, then do their training, and then carbohydrate load, and then train and do that repeatedly, the body, their body, will learn to convert, to move that carbohydrate directly to glycogen and not deposited as body fat. And you know, those ultra athletes have like zero body fat, okay, because they're 
tuned, they've tuned this machine of theirs very much uh, in that way. So glycogen is used that way. Go ahead. So carbohydrate loading works real well. Yeah. But then you're always told afterwards to do some other form of exercise to quote unquote kind of get rid of it or what's that process like? What okay. What, what, what they're really talking about there is that if you, it, it, let's look at it from the standpoint that okay you, you do something very strenuous or, or you do some sprinting and you've built up lactic acid. If all you do is stop and sit on the edge of the curb, what you're going to do is basically it's called repaying the oxygen debt, but it's going to rely on the heart and respiratory system to continue to supply blood to the muscle tissue to, uh, to move that lactic acid either back into the muscles where it can be metabolized or to the liver where it can be metabolized. And if you stop exercising, your brain automatically starts to tell the heart slow down, we don't need to do this anymore because you're supposed to last a lifetime we're done exercising, slow down, and the heart rate will start to go down. Your respiratory rate will also start to go down because the sympathetic nervous system will kick in because you're at rest. And the, and the brain says, I don't care what the other signals are, we're cutting down, okay? That will take longer than if you were to continue to walk around, okay? Because what you're doing with walking around is you're putting modest uh, demands on the cardiovascular system, keeping the heart rate up and respiratory rate up to quicker dissipate that lactic acid. So it, it's right on uh, to do. That's why, that's the whole concept of warm up and cool down exercise. The cool down part, it, yeah, they talk about it. it's muscle stiffness, yeah, because that's lactic acid, but it will help in that recovery. Okay, so that's a, that's a good point. I don't, another question? Sure. I was just watching Yeah. And it went from aerobic to anaerobic, and they said it was very, very bizarre what his body was doing. It's kind of like after three or four minutes, you know, without the oxygen, he was relying on his, you know, I guess his muscles and stuff to, because he could hold it for like five, six minutes, I forget what it was, and he was just kind of like, Well, I'm not familiar with the, with, with that particular case. I mean, um, You were it, just stationary, not measuring. Sure yeah. Um, Well, it, it, that's certainly, some of that would begin to occur, but it, it would be a, it would not be possible for the nervous system to do that, because the nervous system simply cannot operate anaerobically. So, um, I mean, that particular case, I mean, there are lots of things you could do. I mean, obviously, you could, you could pack red blood cells. If you increase red blood cells by increasing hemocrit and increase the, the number of red blood cells in the body, and that's, uh, I mean, one way to do that is move to Denver and train for a few weeks, or collect your blood, spin it down, and put it in, which is illegal in most sports, but you could, but not in, not in breath holding, I'm sure that, that they haven't said that, and then put it back in, you have more red blood cells, you can hold more oxygen, you, you would be able to uh, hold your breath longer. You could work towards uh, increasing myoglobin concentrations by doing some sprinting and training and getting the myoglobin into the muscles, which would reduce their oxygen demand and leave that oxygen in the bloodstream for the brain. And you could work on some relaxation techniques, which would, which would uh, slow, uh, the, the, uh, slow and redirect blood flow from periphery to body core, which would also keep the brain alive. So there could be some things that that guy could be doing to get ready. Um, that he went anaerobic, I mean, technically he's anaerobic because he's not taking in any oxygen, but, but whether, but his, you know, and his muscles may well be anaerobic uh, and conducting anaerobic respiration, but there's no way his brain is or his brain is dead, okay, because there just is no way, brain cannot survive without oxygen. Now those miraculous events where individuals survive under ice and so forth, that's because the body cores 
chilled down, metabolism is brought to near zero, and there's a, you know, a, a fairly large re residue uh, residual of oxygen in the bloodstream anyway. I mean, under normal physiology, you only take uh, uh, three or four percent of the available oxygen out of the hemoglobin. That is, when the oxygen returns to your, to your lungs, it's, it's got lots and lots of oxygen still in it, and you just top it off in the lungs. The idea is that there's that cushion, that residue. That's why in CPR now, they don't, you don't bother with mouth, mouth, you just do chest compressions, because there's enough oxygen in that blood to keep the brain alive for, for several minutes, even, even without breathing, as long as there's circulation. Okay? So, so there would be things that guy could do. I don't know anything about the particular circumstances but, you know, that he could do. I mean, it's believable. But, but I mean, clearly the guy who called him anaerobic was, was a newscaster who didn't know what he was talking about. Okay, so we'll leave it at that. A couple of other short things, because I said, but I'm, I've got, I'm doing good, because we have 17, 18 minutes, so I, I don't have that much left. Um, there's a couple of things here. That is, this graph I just wanted to put up here to show, again, here are those categories of glycolysis, that is anaerobic respiration, the creatine phosphate, phosphate uh, and ATP system that I mentioned, and oxidative phosphorylation, which is aerobic respiration. And it just shows uh, here, depending on what the activity is, that is, if you're doing fast bursts, burst, like weightlifting, that clean and jerk up, and then they throw that thing down, those Olympic... Uh, Weightlifters, uh, they don't. Use, they're not using anything but creatine phosphate. Okay, I mean that's as far as they get because they're pro the whole the whole thing's over in like three or four seconds, right? And so, so yeah, they would be ones that would really have an advantage uh, of using creatine phosphate. And I bet they all do. They also use a lot of anabolic steroids, but that's a whole different matter. Um, so that's that. If you have this sort of less intense but longer, longer duration of a few minutes activity, you're going to you're going to have this peak of anaerobic respiration that cuts in here. But of course, as I said, for the long term, it's always going to be aerobic because aerobic is the only one that's sustainable uh, over long periods of time. That's what I wanted from that. This is the graph I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes on because I think it's kind of interesting. This is, again, these are. These are data from ultra-athletes. That is, these are from well-trained athletes. These are college athletes who are at, you know, the top of their game. These are not me, okay? So we, I want to mention that, though the results really do apply to us. It's just that uh, the, the, the nice peaks and all come because we're talking about good specimens here and quality data. If we add in a bunch of weekend warriors, the, the things would sort of spread out as they sort of spread out. It would sort of spread out. What, what is this graph? Well, this graph is, again, time on this axis. That is, time of activity on this axis. And on this axis, although it's kind of funky, what we're really looking at is the, the amount of a particular substrate that's being used in respiration uh, in O2 uptake. It's, it's measured by O2 uptake. And there's three, three fuels that are used. And that's what I, that's what I want to want, sort of, I'm shifting a little bit the argument or the, the, the emphasis here, but I, uh, not too far. Your cell, like your muscle cells, skeletal muscle cells like to use three fuels. Glucose, which I said is the preferred fuel, glycogen, which is really glucose in disguise, and fatty acids. Okay? Those are the fuels that skeletal muscle cells use. Could they use proteins? Yeah, but you have to be half starved to death to use them. Could they use uh, nucleic acids? You'd really have to be starving to use those because it just doesn't make any sense. But they will use fatty acids, glycogen, and glucose. Let's look at this graph. Let's look first at this line, which is glycogen. And what you see is glycogen is used first, okay? And it's, it's, it makes sense. It's glucose that's packed right around the, well, it's actually inside the cell. So it's right around the sarcomeres, right adjacent where it needs to be used. That's really great. That makes sense. And notice that goes up dramatically. That is, we draw those, we draw those glycogen uh, reserves very quickly and probably within the, oh, first 20, 25 minutes somewhere in that neighborhood, they're going to be starting to 
drop already. That is, we've uh, really starting to exhaust them. Okay, that's glycogen. While that's happening, that is, while the glycogen level, uh, glycogen use is dropping, what's escalating is a combination of blood glucose and fatty acids. Notice here the blood glucose goes up, peaks, and then drops off and sort of levels off. And that happens really oh, somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 60 minutes, 45, 60 minutes is where that happens. And where then we see a, a really out here, the major fuel being used is fatty acids. Well, so what? Well, a couple, couple things about that. First of all, the blood glucose. It goes up, peaks, and then drops down. That is, um, as the cells, these muscle cells who love glucose, are using glucose from glycogen, but that supply is drying up because they've consumed it, start saying, well, I'll take glucose from the bloodstream. And they really start to do that. But there's a point at which they can't take anymore. Because if they drop, that is, if the skeletal muscles absorb sufficient amounts, consume sufficient amounts of blood sugar, blood sugar levels will drop, the brain won't be getting the glucose it needs, you're going to faint. Okay? And most athletic events don't work well when you're passed out. Okay? So, so you don't want that to happen. So the body starts to curb that glucose level. And sure enough, it starts to pull it down. Okay, this is not blood glucose levels in the bloodstream. This is the amount of blood glucose being used by the muscles. Pull it down. As it pulls that down, fatty acids go up, and the fatty acids continue to go up. And here we're, we're almost, we're fueling muscle contraction almost exclude well not exclusively, but significantly by fatty acids. What implication does that have? Well, the implication is if you want exercise for cardiovascular, 20 minutes of a hard cardiovascular exercise is fine. 20, 25 minutes, treadmill, elliptical, whatever. If you want weight loss, you've got to push it to at least 40 to 45 minutes. Because you're not even using fatty acids to very significantly until out here. You're really using a blend of fuels here. It's out here, really, which is really well over an hour and so forth, which is why losing weight is so hard, because you have to exercise for an hour or more. Who's got the time? Who's got the, who's got the initiative to do that? But the point is that, it, that that's the key, and you'll hear that. You hear trainers say that all the time. For weight loss, you have to sustain the activity for at least 40 minutes or more. That's prob it's, it's in that window, 35, 40 minutes. Anything above that, you'll burn, you'll burn the fatty acids and actually see some results. Anything below that, you're doing great cardio, which is, which is important, but not going to be weight loss, okay? And that doesn't even, this, this will occur even without, it doesn't have to be strenuous. That's why walking is a good exercise for weight loss. Because you can, stay, you can sustain that for an hour or so, okay? And you'll have pushed it to the fatty acid level where you're using fatty acids, and it'll effectively work, so okay? Regardless of well, say, it would be yeah, uh, strenuousity. I don't know. No, I don't know. <laughs> strenuousness? Um, no, it's true. Yeah, it, more strenuous would get you there faster. Okay, and would, would burn fat faster because you're going to burn calories faster. So yeah, but I'm saying that, that, that if what you're trying to do, is, you know, and you can't be on a tre and, and, and you don't want to be on a treadmill for an hour, a walk will not do as much, but will work, okay? Whereas 20 minutes on the treadmill, you say, well, I only have 20 minutes, so I'll do the 20 minutes every day and I'll lose weight. No, you won't, okay? I mean, you might lose most a pound because you sweat and so you'll lose water okay but it won't work that's the key and that's what that's all based on and it's true the other thing is this red line is when you quit okay and notice that when you quit you still get fatty acid use it can actually go up but uh, it, it, it will continue these drop off pretty quickly uh, when you stop Okay, why, why that is, I don't have a real answer for, but the, the, the key here is, is you hear people say that if you exercise, you'll continue to burn fat later in the day. 
Absolutely true. There you see it. But you've got to get to this point to push it to that so, that so the fatty acids will continue to, uh, to rise, okay? Or the fatty acid use will continue to rise. Yes? Okay. <laughs> so, so I just point that out. Now, a couple of other questions came up about hitting the wall. What's the wall? Well, the wall is, uh, can also be thought of this red line. Typically what's going to happen is sooner or later you're going to reach a point where the cells just, uh, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll characterize them. I shouldn't do it this way, but it makes it easier. You'll reach a point where the skeletal muscles will once again start to draw blood sugar level. Now, if you stop voluntarily before that, you can get this bump in fatty acid consumption, weight loss, life is good, and all. But if you push this, and this red line is when you're thoroughly exhausted, what happens at that point is blood sugar level drops. And as soon as blood sugar level drops, it affects the brain, okay? And you'll start to feel either lightheaded, dizzy, or you'll drop on the side of the road, which a lot of marathon runners will do. Pardon? It won't, uh, well, because the nervous system is no longer functioning, the muscles won't contract. That's why you collapse on the side of the, the road. I think I'm answering your question. No, it doesn't change anything in the physiology of the muscle because the muscles, uh, you know, are controlled by the uh, nervous system and without constant impulses from the nervous system to contract, they'll just stop and that's what will happen. So those people just drop like a, like a, uh, a rock uh, along the side road. Okay, um, and that's, that's, as I said, that's full, that's full exhaustion uh, at that point because at that point you can see the glycogen is completely gone, the, the glucose uh, depletion uh, of the blood glucose goes down. The fatty acids are still there, but it doesn't matter at that point because the nervous system is shut down. Okay, that's, and the nervous system trumps it all because it's the major system. Okay, any other questions about that? Because I, I don't know. I don't know if you, but I think that's kind of cool. Uh, the last thing I mentioned, very last thing, and then you are free to go, is, yeah, other fuels can be used. That is, in this process of cellular respiration. You can use nucleic acids, proteins, polysaccharides, and lipids. Uh, they all have to be broken into monosaccharides for, monosaccharides, mon monomers first. They have to go from polymer to monomer. They have to be in the monomeric form. And they insert at various stages. And that's all I'm going to say. I'm doing a lot of hand waving because I really don't want to go into detail here. But they insert in various places, whether it's in the transition reaction, as with most of the beta uh, uh, oxidation of uh, fatty acids or down in the Krebs cycle itself. That means that some of them will provide more or less uh, energy gain depending on where they insert. Uh, it also depends on what the preparation is, how much energy, so whether you get a net or not. Some of these particular, some proteins are so difficult to hydrolyze that by the time you go to all that trouble, you really don't get very much of a net gain. These things won't be used very often often though. I mean, cells really try their best not to metabolize proteins and nucleic acids, at least not for cellular energy. They, they, they really avoid it at all costs, which makes sense because the proteins are often structural or, control, or enzymatic, and you don't want to be consuming your enzymes and your, 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 your cellular structure uh, unless it's a very dire situation where there's just no energy. So on a hunger strike or something, you see that. You see them lose muscle mass because they're consuming their muscles. Okay, from within. Okay, any questions? That's it, I'm done. Well, thank you. Now, like I said, next time we're going to work on these case studies. We'll use the clickers a lot in those because there's a lot of sort of uh, trying to figure step from step and a forensics. Uh, uh,